Bueno, bienvenidos a la segunda sesión de, de, las, de las terceras jornadas, de la tercera edición de, de las jornadas Reparando el Pasado. I will speak Spanish because obviously the simultaneous translation uh, will make it easier for everyone to understand everything that's being said in English will be translated into Spanish. Everything that's being said in Spanish will be translated into English. Apologies because we've had to make a number of changes in our agenda. And finally, we will have to We will have a session which is very different from the session we had originally planned. We will have two speakers uh, that will discuss experiences in the area of policies that museums are developing with regards to reparation of historical processes of decolonization and also communities that were deliberately marginated for the construction of their own uh, historical memory and collective memory. These museums will share their experiences and will speak through the words of the director of the Africa Museum in Belgium, Bart Avery, and then also by the director, Peter Buren, excuse me, and the director of the American Mu Mu Museum. After these two papers, we will open a session of questions and answers. And they will share, we will be able to listen to their experiences. And not only will we be able to listen to what they have to explain, but we will also have the opportunity to speak with them and ask questions. And uh, this session will enable us to understand how ethnological museums and, and world culture museums are transforming themselves, originally designed to disseminate information and uh, about these cultures which were labeled as exotic, exotic in Europe, uh, at the same time with an intention of appropriation of symbolic and cultural values from a very um, Western-centered perspective. Now, all of this is what we're leaving behind. We're entering uh, new roads, and hopefully today's session will enable us to see what this transformation is about and to debate about all these changes. I would like to introduce the, pre the director of the Terburen Museum, Bart Overy. Mr. Bart Aubry, who studied history and communication science. He's a Belgian diplomat uh, since 1986, and he has had different uh, positions representing Belgium in the European Union and abroad. Since 2008, he was spokesperson of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Brussels. He then became Belgian ambassador in Kenya, and in 2011, he was also permanent representative and uh, for MoMA and Habitat. In 2014, Bart uh, moved back to Brussels and became director of human rights and democracy. In 2016, he became ambassador of the European Union in the Democratic Republic of Congo. He then held the same position in Mali since 2019. And from 2023, he is the new director of the African Museum at Terburen. Good morning or good afternoon, uh, Mr. Ouvry. Whenever you're ready, you can start. Is that okay. Um, please interrupt me if, if, if you can't hear me well. Um, well, well, thank you for this presentation. Um, you may be asked why, why have a diplomat in, in, in a museum? Um, well, I think that there's two good reasons for that. Uh, the first reason is that I, I lived now and I was an ambassador for almost 10 years in African countries. So I've lived in Africa, so I have a network there. And having lived there, uh, helps in order to understand certain sensibilities. Um, secondly, 
uh, I believe that uh, a museum is, is mediating. We are mediators. Uh, we are mediating between the past and the present, between Africa and Europe, between uh, different cultures. So I believe, in, and it, it remains to be seen because I've only been here for six months. Maybe in, in, in a few months I'll be thrown out, um, but not this far. Um, I'll, I'll have four main points. Uh, let me present those four points very quickly and then, then uh, I'll start. Uh, first of all, we are not just a museum. We're in a way a museum about the museum. I'll, I'll, I'll explain why. Uh, because we have to question ourselves. As you already pointed out, um, what is the legitimacy of an African museum in Belgium? Uh, do you have something like, let's say, a Europe museum somewhere in Africa? Not really. So um, we have to know why and we have to uh, reflect about ourselves. My second point will be, we're not just a museum about the museum and about colonialism, etc. We are also a museum about Africa. And I would underline with Africans, that's maybe important. We were created as a museum about Africa, but we want to be working with uh, Africa. It's, it's a completely different concept. Um, we are also a museum with a role in society. I think today more and more, uh, even originally in the 19th century when museums were created, uh, they had a role in society. Well, today this role has evolved. And so I'll have a few words about that. And my, my fourth point uh, will be about, I think it's inescapable. Uh, if we talk about repairing the past, we should talk about uh, restitution. So uh, four points, uh, and I think I have a, bit, a quarter of an hour, not more than 20 minutes. I'll try to stick to that. My first point is, is why should we be a museum about the museum? Well, for that, I have to explain to you our, our history. Uh, we were created uh, after the World Exhibition in Belgium, in, in Brussels, in which there was a chapter in a place a bit outside uh, Brussels, the previous uh, hunting grounds of the Duke of Brabant, which actually was the then King uh, Leopold II. He um, had a Congo chapter because this was his almost personal project. You know that originally Congo was not a Belgian colony. The government was not very committed to this. Uh, Leopold took it in his own hands. And so he was king of this uh, faraway country. But of course, he needed support. He needed investment. He needed political support. And so he, he, he looked for a way of communicating. So the World Exhibition was quite a success. And there was uh, what we now call a human zoo, a Congolese village uh, on those hunting grounds. It had a tremendous success. Uh, of course, today we kind of realize that those who were sitting there, the Congolese citizens, were not necessarily very happy. Seven of them died uh, and were buried here in the village where we have the museum. Um, and he then decided to create a museum because he saw the success, the interest and the support which he got that way from the population. Um, a museum was created and about half of our collections coming from Congo, and that's two-thirds of the cultural objects which are here, they have been obtained during this period of the free state of Congo. Um, that was a period of conquest, and it was also a period of exploitation. You probably heard about red rubber. Uh, rubber was the main income uh, for that, and the way it was organized was extremely uh, was extremely violent sometimes. Uh, and so it was due to the scandal which it caused uh, all over the world up to the United States that in the end, Leopold II decided this will no longer be my personal property or my, my personal domain. It will become a Belgian property and it will become more of a mainstream um, uh, uh, colony. Um, this has, up till 1960, till the independence of Congo, been a colonial museum. So we are, let's say, unique. There's a number, for example, in Paris, the Africa Museum or the World Museum, which you have there, the Cape Henri, uh, it was moved into another building. 
We didn't do that. We stayed within the same building for different reasons. The main reason being that uh, we believe that uh, everything passes except the past. Um, you have to look your past into the eyes and you cannot be legitimate today if you don't recognize the mistakes, sometimes the crimes which were committed in the past. So you have to take them to, to account. This means that we are to a certain degree a museum very much looking at its own role. And part of that role, for example, was creating a certain way of looking at Africa. And we have, for example, a number of statues, a number of uh, uh, objects which were created during the colonial period and which confirm some of the stereotyping of the negative views on, on Congo. The, the, most, the, the one which is well known is Leopard Man. You see a masked uh, uh, Congolese man who is in the process of killing uh, someone. This is not historical because there were Leopard Man existed, but on those costumes, uh, whenever they were analyzed, we have never found even one drop of blood. So it was certainly not masked man who would go out and kill others. And it's really, it was something which was put into evidence almost at the entrance of the museum. And even when we renovated, because we have now fundamentally changed our setup, for five years, we've moved this, and it was almost the first thing which we saw. We said, yes, this is no longer the way we want to work, but we still showed it. Today, we decided this is stereotyping image and we should not show it without accompaniment, without an introduction. We should somewhat filter the message in order not to keep repeating the same mistakes. We should not just be a museum about the colony. Yes, we want to have a critical look on our old past, but it should not be our only mission. And though that way I come to my second point. My second point is that we must be a museum about Africa and a museum working with Africans. Um, one of my colleagues during my first weeks in the job, one of my Congolese colleagues, he told me, Bart, you should not reduce us to our colonial past. We have a past which is way longer. In our museum, you can see, you know, we find objects which date back uh, behind the, or the tooth, for example, a copy of a tooth uh, dating back to 2 million years ago. And we show objects from 200,000 years ago in, in Congo or in other African places. We show a mask which dates back to the, from Angola, which dates back to the 8th of the 9th century. So there is much more than the colonial past. And of course, the colonial past, in principle, stopped somewhere in the 60s of the past century. There has been a history since then. And one of the, the mistakes which we have committed, even in our present day permanent uh, representation of colonial history, you see what the colonial officers did, the mistakes they made. But what we kind of forget, or at least which we have difficulties to show, it's the action of the Congolese. The Congolese were not just victims. They organized themselves, uh, they resisted, uh, they were workers, uh, there was a whole change in society. We kind of forget about that because of course our basis of our collection is colonial, but that is not an excuse in order not to give a balanced view of what Africa today is about. So that's the first point. I think we can find solutions for that. You know, there is photography, there are many other sources, there, are, there is oral history, uh, there is no reason why we shouldn't sh show the role of Africans during the colonial era, before and after. My second point is that uh, we have to work with our African colleagues. Uh, today we have cooperation, uh, scientific cooperation, biology, wood biology, for example, very important because it's linked to climate change. Uh, we have geology, uh, we have, uh, of course, the whole uh, historic and uh, sociological and anthropological uh, uh, activities. For us, it's important to do that uh, with Africans. Um, we, we have to be honest. We tended to go there with our knowledge, with, uh, of course, the support of our collections, and we would usually tell them where to go, what to do. Um, this is gradually changing. 
uh, a word like partnership, a word like co-creation is a reality. Uh, if we really want to be balanced and to have a good view, you need, wh whether you organize an exhibition or whether you uh, have a research project, you need to have different views. And in order to have different diversified, balanced views, you need to imply our African colleagues. Otherwise, you're not doing a good job. Um, that's, that's why I talk uh, about a museum working with Africa. So we are Africa Museum, but not about, but with Africa. The partnership is really at the heart of our legitimacy as uh, uh, a museum. That brings me to my third point. Uh, we are also a museum uh, for society. Um, we have, for example, recently, um, uh, and that is really at the beginning, at the entrance of our museum, we have a space about racism. Racism. Uh, is not just a thing about the past. If I talked about the human zoo in 1897, um, well, let's be frank, in, in 1958, uh, two years before the independence of Congo, uh, there was a major world exhibition in Belgium. And at the beginning, there was again a human zoo. Um, very early on, because, you know, there were Congolese visiting and, you know, there was uh, even politicians, it became a scandal right from the start and it was closed down after a few weeks. But even then, we kind of organized this kind of uh, human garden. And there is a tendency to say, oh, yes, Leopold II, he was terrible. But, but after that, you know, we've become all good world citizens. We have to recognize that today in our societies in Europe, uh, and certainly here in Brussels, we have racism. Uh, only a few weeks ago, one of our researchers from Congo, he was on the public transport and he was physically attacked uh, with a very clear racist undertone, you know, that he was, uh, the N word was, was uh, used, etc. So um, we have to play a role in society today, not just looking critically at our past, but also to look critically at at our present, to show how we contributed in the past as a museum to some of the stereotypes about Africans, but also to today to have a role in terms of education uh, and in terms of cooperation. So this cooperation with uh, 20 other African countries uh, is very important because uh, it's the way for us not just uh, to, I would say, enrich our collections, uh, do our research, but it is also a question of legitimacy uh, as a scientific institution uh, to uh, play a role in some of the basic uh, uh, problems in terms of biodiversity, in terms of uh, the uh, addition uh, of uh, the, the role which uh, Africa plays uh, in uh, climate uh, change and in mitigating uh, climate change. The forest, the equatorial forest uh, in Congo and around Congo in Central Africa is one of the last places where really the, the, the CO2 is, is uh, carbon is, is captivated in a durable way. Um, it brings me to my last point, which is very much uh, linked to the idea of, of reparation. It's uh, restitution. Uh, since last year, we, we have a law, a Belgian law, which clearly says what is stolen uh, will go back. Uh, of course, it, it's not necessarily so clear cut and, and simple uh, because, well, how do you define what is stolen? Uh, how do you go about uh, restitution? Um, the first uh, uh, um, condition to do it well is to uh, do it in a bilateral way, uh, in a cooperative way. Um, we need, uh, in order to do it well, to have a uh, clear basis, a bilateral agreement with the country involved. The first one, which we will, is, is Congo, because two thirds of our collections at the federal level uh, on Africa are from Congo. And so we'll have a bilateral agreement. We will create a common uh, a commission of scientists, uh, Congolese scientists and Belgian scientists. There may be Afri other Africans or Europeans in there. And they will look into each demand request for 
uh, restitution. Upstream, before that, there needs to be a major effort, and that is ongoing, for provenance research, because we have not in the past sufficiently documented uh, our, the origin of our collections. We are doing that. There is extra budget for that. There are more researchers. And we have here now, since September, we have five full-time Congolese researchers who are doing this work with us. And I'm convinced that much more effort will be needed before we can come to any conclusions. The Commission can make a recommendation and then the decision will be uh, political from both sides to decide, yes, we consider this as stolen and it needs to be, become the property of the first will be the Congolese state. Um, there's some, you know, there's some traps there because those objects, they originally came from a community and why can't this community claim to get this object returned. Our principle is, our, our, our belief is that these objects um, are a matter that their fate in Congo needs to be decided by the Congolese. It is not for us to decide who we restitute to. It should be the Congolese government who does so in the best possible way. But of course, if this would not if there wouldn't be a broad consensus within Congo, it would make the legitimacy of our operation difficult. The second problem is that many, many Africans tell me, you know, the objects, yes, yes, well, they're important, but it's not just about the objects. It's also about our whole culture. Uh, whether it is the colonial civil servants, whether it is uh, the missionaries, they have made a tremendous effort to substitute the European religion Catholicism or other religions, uh, your systems, your cultural systems, with our original culture, and we lost that. You have to help us, you have to take a more holistic view. You have to help us to reconnect with our own culture. And that today is not easy. Today, it's seen, many of those objects are considered in Congo, for example, as as sorcerers. You know, this is stuff you, you don't want to have in your house, it's dangerous. And so, if we want to do a good job in terms of uh, restitution, if we want this to be a legitimate operation, uh, we need to take care not to do it in a one-sided manner. We have to take into account the real demands, not just of the Congolese uh, government, but also to be very attentive to the demands from the society, from the communities. Um, this means that we need to have a broader view and also have a cooperation in terms of culture, uh, in terms of strengthening uh, the capacities of museums. Uh, for example, and, and I think that's an interesting uh, project, we have a network of uh, European and uh, uh, African uh, museum directors, in the framework of that uh, network, we want to cooperate and we have to, you know, work together in order to find solutions and, for example, to organize traveling uh, uh, exhibitions. Uh, why is there hardly any exhibition going from Africa to Europe or from Europe to Africa and traveling in several capitals? I think that would be a way of really coming together and uh, working in a true spirit of partnerships and to have common projects. Um, there's one last question, uh, which is sometimes uh, asked. Many people say, this must be very difficult for your museum because you're gonna lose part of your collection. Um, I, would say, I would say that the whole restitution discussion is very important and is a, an opportunity for us as world museums. Uh, if we continue as we do and we stay in our ivory tower, you know, um, our legitimacy as partners, our legitimacy to do the research uh, in Africa or in other countries of the world uh, to cooperate will become ever more controversial. So for our legitimacy as world museums, it is essential that we really enter into this exercise and cooperate. The object as such can never be an objective 
as such. Uh, frankly, our collection, we have 120,000 cultural objects. We have 8,000 uh, traditional instruments. We have 10 million of uh, specimen of insects. We have 1 million of specimen of fish. You know, sharing this is really obvious. Uh, and um, if, for example, uh, I can see that our, our Congolese partners, certainly the research who are here, they look at uh, the objects as a priority, which are lacking in their own uh, um, in their own um, uh, collections. And they say, we want to be able to respond to every community in our country and to reconnect them with their culture. So that is our main objective. So while we, in our own legislation, tend to concentrate on the reparation uh, team, the uh, view from the African side, certainly from the Congolese side, is more holistic and is one of reconnecting with their own culture, where reparation is certainly something which is in the back of their mind, but it is not the only request to which we need to answer. I think I talked for too long already, so I'm going to shut up. Thank you. Muchas gracias, Bart. Thank you very much. Bart, I don't know if anybody among our audience would like to ask a question about the subject presented by Bart. We keep the questions for the end, and we will listen to the rest of the speakers first, and we will have a Q&A at the end of the session so we can exchange our opinions. Now, we're going to give the floor to Andres Gutierrez. Let me tell you in advance, he's a doctor in uh, history by the University of America, America de Madrid, specialized in anthropology. He belongs to the faculty of conservators of the museum. He's in charge of the Museum of America. He had also developed other uh, presidency, such for example, the head of uh, the department and responsible for projects at that museum. He is also a commissioner of different exhibitions, author of several articles related to the management of collections and museum collections, archaeology and heritage, and also several monographies on museology and archaeology nor of the Norlandes. He also belongs to the research team of one of research and development projects. And if I'm not mistaken, he's in charge of reinventing museums, right? So now we are going to listen to Andres Gutierrez for about 20 minutes. We kindly ask you not to go beyond that time in order to have time for the Q&A. And I guess that you will also tell us about the different projects you are developing related to this change which these ethnological museums are undergoing with a new sensibility towards working on social representation, collective imaginations, etc., in order to revisit a little bit the history they've gone through. Mr. Gutierrez, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Thanks to the museum. Thank you, Uriol, for your kind introduction. Thank you, Celeste. Thank you, Ricard, for being here together with us. I'm going to start by giving you a quick perspective on the new discourses and perspectives uh, from our museum. You are probably familiar with our museum. It's in a very uh, symbolic place. It's this green building at the entry of the university village in Madrid, Moncloa, near Arco de la Victoria. It was created in 1941, right after the end of civil war. So there is an important load so this is the building, as I was saying, was created in 1941 as a museum, but the collections date from much before. I'm not going to dwell on these aspects and all the aspects related to the creation of the museum, the moment it was created and the ideological load of the building or the history of the collections, because I want to highlight aspects related to new discourses, new perspectives, and new subjects, and perspectives that we are attempting to apply. These perspectives are related to the turn of the century. Since the 70s, 
museums have undergone a very important transformation, the new museology that was created in the 70s. And in reality, we're seeing how the new society, and we can mention the Society of Rotense in 1999, thinking about how this new society, Western society, was going to be or Bauman's society, liquid society, two different perspectives. With the beginning of the 21st century, there was a transformation of Western society, and this is the context in which we can frame these ruptures which are happening within the discourse, which can be applied to museums. These courses that are related to the patriarchal perspective, a new line and vision on gender and sexuality, the Eurocentric dominant perspective, which is breaking away from this perspective, generating a new interculturality, new application of diversity. He's asking if he's going too fast. He's going to be a bit fast, but it's okay. <laughs> this colonialist uh, discourses, the one that brings us here, uh, the new vision of this dominant discourse, which is predominant in museums, causing these new lines and discourses about decolonization and the invisibility of marginalized groups, generating new discourses related to the other and also the subject of identities, very interesting, an imposition that has been made. Art in general has contributed to generating a specific identity and how we are trying to be far away from these discourses and narrations. And these new values are related to a transformation of museums, a general transformation of society. How can this be reflected in my museum, Museo de America, like my colleague. I have not been in charge of the museum for long, just since the month of May, but we have been able to apply new working guidelines. And since we cannot transform the permanent museography of the museum, we thought about incorporating new spaces of reflection, reflection within the permanent collection, not as temporary collections, although they will be temporary. And these are going to reflect reflections uh, about what I've mentioned, the heritage of presence of African descendant on gender diversity, on the construction of the image of America, sustainability subjects or issues, environment, climate change, a general coincidence because this responds to the new challenges of the contemporary society. Uh, independence, which is other aspects that in the museums have not been reflected before. And then uh, the crossbreeding of cultural mix or mixed culture, hot points for debate, uh, small modules that can be added to the existing museography in order to prefer to provoke a reflection on the visitor. It's going to be part of the permanent exhibition. And they can change with time, because what we want is to take a look at the other voices. This is not a discourse that wants to be generated by the museum, but rather a window that we open on new works. We are working on Afro-descendants and a specialist about the descendant origin from Africa. Our subject is America, not Africa, but there is some bonds. There are some bonds and associations such as collectives, etc. So we are working in order to generate those contents. Let me mention four aspects which are very much related to our conference our discourses and everything that we want to do related to the seminar gathering us around here. Recovering memory through making visible those collectives that were invisible. We've been working on Afro-descendant presence in the museum, something that has not been uh, dealt with in the discourse. The current discourse of the permanent museography dates from 1994, although 10 years ago, uh, we started to work on this, 10 years before, and the subject of the Afro-descendant presence had not been considered important or was not dealt with. So we have an audiovisual, a theme uh, path, and we talked about different aspects. I'm sure that you're familiar with this work of art. 
I'm sure you're familiar with this. And this is a deposit of the National Museum of El Prado. It was painted in Quito, representing what has been named and called the Mulatos de Esmeraldas. Why is it called like this when the name of those people represented here is painted on the picture on top of the heads of those people. We see Francisco Darobe, Don Pedro, and to the right, Bingo, and the ages of each one of them. So one of the questions that we have to deal with, besides placing value on the history of this picture, because this picture speaks about freedom processes, the fight of slavery, mamas, the agreements with the audience, and how they become governors of a certain region. What we want is to reflect on the names and titles of the works of art. It should be named Portrait of Don Francisco de Arobe and his two sons, Caciques of Esmeraldas, which is a province in the coast of Ecuador. So we are inviting a specialist uh, Julia Cabrera, Fernando Barbosa, specialist, and we've been we have organized uh, an open round table in order to deal with the subjects that we want to deal with. And I don't know if it's very fruitful or no. And we have a specific round tables in order to provide ourselves with the content that are going to be part of this part of reflection. First content, and this is going to be changing depending on the different voices that we hear and the needs for these voices and how we should approach new discourses within our permanent collection. The second aspect I wanted to touch upon uh, was what Mignot was uh, referring to, the policies of knowledge or politics of knowledge. We've always used the same criteria the criteria of the museum of a specific country, of a specific culture about the others, because we are always speaking about the others. And this dominance of the territory and thinking has been materialized in the way we look at objects. I am bringing this sentence, and this is an article by Jose Marin, and as by way of reflection, and this is the first uh, idea that I can launch here is to debate whether we are going through a new phase, which is a continuity of a phase that started back in the 15th century. I'm talking about America, but it can also be applied to Africa. Colonizing America began um, in the 15th century, evangelizing the non-believers. So we create different categories depending on a religious uh, category. But it will be like the civilization, civilization of wild people. This is not related to the religious perspective, but the cultural perspective, whether they are civilized or not, but always naming them as wild or pagans. And 20th century, we're talking about underdeveloped countries. And here we change our prism from religion, point of view of civilization, in order to speak about the economy, which is, was prevalent in the 20th century. What happens in the 21st century? And I wonder if all this process, decolonizing process, I don't know if we can be uh, focused on this or no, but uh, maybe it can mean turning those groups and those countries into another country that has to be decolonized from Europe. We are putting them in different categories. And if we don't have this line, we'll have another one. Because uh, in Europe, we're always uh, working on, uh, on the otherness, right? And I was uh, speaking about this single way of thinking. And this is just an example. We've seen a uh, chair of the Mantenian culture. This is a culture from Ecuador before the Inca um, um, conquest. And this is an object uh, that seems like a chair with arms. In America, this type of furniture does not exist. And it's related to other uh, type of furniture, which are high uh, tables. So local chiefs, a manteño sitting on a chair, were using them as a stools, low stools. And here we are categorizing. And this is something that we apply uh, from the Hispanic past, from the European perspective. Uh, no chair to sit, no kingdom. Those 
suspects and those suspects have been categorized as chairs looking for this symbolism related to high hierarchies such as the use of thrones and this is the way this is being represented in Ecuador, we can see an excavation site where we are building what we call a council of local thieves, chiefs. And these uh, chairs, not thieves, but chiefs, sorry. These chairs, which are called, well, this is just the Western revision of something that we think could have been applied. If you are interested, I don't know whether to unveil the mystery, there is a publication called Metaphors of Lineage, where we approach a new perspective and thinking not from the Western perspective. This is a chair. But what type of object is this and what will be its function? And the third one, my apologies, I don't have a lot of time links with what is contemporary. When we approach the past, we have to do it from a contemporary uh, perspective. What can it mean for nowadays? And this is something I've mentioned before. We're working with communities. We organize a transgender, uh, transgender exhibition with LGBT, LGBT associations, uh, transgender uh, people and children in order to see what did we have to approach in this study, in this temporary exhibition, including a cover of a catalog? Working with the communities, but also bringing this to the present. There is nowadays discrimination about LGBTI people, yes, because we've suffered this in the museum when we organize the exhibition, I can tell you about it, but we always kept in mind positive aspects because this narration has been incorporated into the narration of the museum. So far, nobody spoke about transgender people in America when it's a permanent reality that you can see in any chronicle from the 16th to the 19th century. And here we were able to buy contemporary works of art, photography, portraits by Alvaro Laiz in Venezuela, uh, someone called Tidawina, trans women, and in Oaxaca, pictures of Nuria Lopez with these trans women. We also work with migrant communities. This is one of the essential aspects. We cannot speak about America without America, as <coughs> our colleague was saying before. And we organized a project which concluded already, unfortunately, but it was very interesting because it was an open project, virtual project, where stories, videos, and pictures could be uploaded in order to explain uh, the narration of migration from the perspective of the migrant. We stimulate the production of some stories from the museum, but in Mexico, they took this project, they adopted this project in order to narrate migration stories uh, towards the US, wet bags, etc. And I think these were students cases of family members who had gone under circumstances or migration processes towards the US. Gender is another important aspect. I have five minutes left. Uh, gender is something we want to deal with. And there is something important. We don't want to uh, omit our mistakes. This is another current perspective. We have to be able to recognize our mistakes. When I was studying the pre-Hispanic art, when I took a look at the pre-Hispanic uh, works of art from the gender perspective and the different categories, we appreciated many mistakes and mistaken identifications that had happened for the last 30 years in the museum. Uh, for example, in the representation of a chief, when in the writing you could see the female genitals. So we published a video in Instagram and then guided visits uh, saying that the perspective that we applied from our optic has to be revisited. This gender perspective has been applied to this virreinal art. This is a fantastic picture representing the daughter of a virrey in the new Spain, in Mexico, but Viceroy, and representing uh, someone forgotten by history. It's difficult they appear together. It's an indigenous uh, woman full of tattoos, 
and she has a controplasia, and we organize an exhibition about this. So we are revisiting the collections from different perspectives in order to offer new narrations, new discourses, which are related to what I meant. I have four minutes left to speak about another aspect gathering us here, which is plunder and restitution. When we speak about pre-Hispanic art, countries are asking and claiming the devolution of works of art, or which are part of these plundering processes. And this is something that has to be pontualized. Um, auctions, for example, uh, encourage this plundering, the illicit traffic documented by several countries. But when there is a plunder in Spain, I speak from the perspective of the Museum of America, because we have been uh, hosting uh, plunder works of art, devolution happens. I know a couple of cases since I've been in the museum. Three, one, several countries, 691 works of art returned to Colombia in 2014-2015. This devolution process, which is related to a commission organized by the embassy, because Spain cannot say, I'm sending you the pieces so of art. The country has to require them, and therefore we have a specific commission. Spain and the Ministry of Culture got in touch with the embassies in order to request the restitution of these works of art. The process ended up very well when uh, the works of art are plunder, because we're talking about plundering illicit uh, sites and irregular uh, extraction of these works of art. So it's easy to understand a pre-Hispanic work of art should have a presence in Spain, a legal one. What happens when we speak about objects that have been moved in the 18th, 19th century? We enter into uncharted territory, and one of the claims I guess you are all thinking about this. It's the Kimbaya treasure and Colombia. So we've been speaking about the Institute of Anthropology, the Colombian Institute of uh, Anthropology, and we organized three different phases of collaboration, uh, workshop, forum, made by experts in museums and patrimony, a seminar with four conferences for different contexts, historical, archeological, archeometric, legal. We decided to approach it from a legal perspective to see what was the context in which to play this patrimony. And finally, we also have a third phase, which is a virtual exhibition. We're working on it. Conclusion that we reach with each one of these situations is that the study has to be individualized. We shouldn't generalize. Not all Colombian patrimony uh, has been plundered. Uh, part of it is in Spain from recent times, but we have to speak about different questions. Are we talking about legal restitution or moral restitutions? Because these are two different things. Legal restitution, in the case of the Kimbaya treasury, you have to take a look at the legal situation of the 19th century. What is the difference? We are talking about plundering, clear nowadays, but not so clear in the 18th and 19th century. And also identities, wishes construction, imaginary, etc. Therefore, there is also a temporal limit for this type of revisions. And this is a question we could ask ourselves. How long can we go in order to place a limit to these revisions? Or can we maybe go to the back to the past? Any date? That's a question. On the other hand, who should be restituted? Who is the owner? of the works of art. Are we speaking about countries newly created? Are we speaking about nations within countries, communities, people, direct descendants? Who are we speaking about in every case? And something else that has to be taken into account. Uh, in the case of state museums, it's not something that I can decide nowadays as a director of the Museum of America, because we are talking about the Ministry of Culture Decisions made related to specific heritage can have consequences on other museums with similar patrimony. So they have to be agreed decisions. And this is a final screen. There are some risks which are obvious. And nowadays, everything we're going through is very much related to the confusion generated around these subjects. 
first aspects related to decolonization, all the processes that I have mentioned before, uh, not only about the others, but others. We have been self-decolonized, but also restitution. Both terms are mixed. Part of the process is restitution, but decolonizing means much more. And the use of lies uh, by the press, fallacies, uh, false hint in order to deviate attention. If, uh, from a legal perspective, colonies did exist or not, that's not the debate. I'm talking about America independently of uh, vice kingdoms. Uh, some of them cannot have any other name. The fallacy of casualty. If colonies did not exist, because this is what's being denied, there is no decolonization possible, because we are speaking about different processes. Uh, questioning authority and museums. Uh, we also have a voice, and we have to remain silent. Equivalence, decolonizing and restitution, a series of fallacies that have been read. I don't know if on purpose or not, but behind this there is a lack of data, lack of information, and half-truths. And at least we should be aware of this. Great. Thank you very much. Well, first of all, we would like to thank both Bart and Andres for being so concise and for not overextending the time you had. Uh, but we know you have to leave at 6, so what we will do now is open a turn, a round of questions about your presentations, and after that we will listen to uh, make us conference, a monographical conference that was what was originally designed for the closing of these um, international seminars. If anybody amongst our audience would like to place a question for either of both speakers. Please, let's do this now. And after that, we will be able to listen to the conference presented by Clement Ameka. Well, two excellent presentations, uh, very interesting. But I see that both gentlemen mm, are presenting or using as excuse the fact that if, have, that if we do have museums, it is for um, dissemination of knowledge purposes. That's, that was my, my understanding of what has been said. And, and I also see that what is really valued is owning this, all these pieces, all these works of art, because they are original and because they are unique. Wouldn't we be able to do the same using copies? Couldn't we return the original pieces and keep copies in our museums? I can imagine this would might be very costly, but perhaps when we uh, uh, restore and return all these pieces to their original countries, we could pay for copies to be made, because having an original Picasso or having a copy, really, it's not so relevant. That's So my question is along these lines. Why do we uh, consider it so relevant that the piece is original or not? Well, let me say that the collections are very different in uh, each of these museums. In the case of the museum, a Museo America, you have a lot of archaeological pieces. In the African Museum, we do have many objects which comes from communities uh, which continue to exist. They, they, they are alive. So in some cases, these objects could be qualified as um, crafts, and they also are functional elements which form part of their myths and their beliefs. Very, uh, but in many cases, the pieces that you have at the Museo de America belong to societies which no longer exist. So by 
by Illusion Smart, I guess you would like to uh, reply to the question. Yes, thank you very much. Um, I would say that um, we have about 8,000, 80,000 uh, cultural, cultural uh, objects from uh, um, Congo. And Congo, only in its National Museum in Kinshasa, has uh, about 35,000 pieces. Um, and I'm not mentioning the uh, other, I'm hearing the translation, which is not ideal. Um, I don't know, this could be. Um, there are also, so actually the object is not necessarily the, um, it, it is as much an opportunity as a burden. Uh, you know, the uh, conditions uh, for taking care of those uh, objects are not easy you know you need certain temperature so i believe what is essential is that we listen to what are the needs of our interlocutors in africa and they insist on on uh, the action what is the demand of the people it's to get in touch with the culture of their uh their, their parents their grandparents um they want to understand what it's about. And certainly, this means that you return a number of pieces. Um, but I don't believe there is uh, a demand that we return everything. Um, there is an opportunity for Africa to have an Africa museum in Europe. You know, we're in Brussels, which well, we, we consider as the capital of Europe, uh, to have this as a showcase for the richness, for the wealth, uh, and for the history, and also for the, the past, has added value. So I believe this question of returning all the objects is what I sometimes hear from the diaspora here in, uh, in Brussels, here in Belgium. It is not what I hear from when I go to, to, to Congo that there is a, a different demand, which is about reconnecting with the culture. And culture is not about objects. Culture is about what is behind the objects. It's about spirituality. It's about uh, the, social, the, 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 the way of connecting as social beings at the time. So I don't think the, the, the question of restitution should be uh, defined in that way. But certainly, uh, whether it is on loan or returning in full ownership pieces is something which is happening right now. But it is not the only answer to the many questions which are asked to us in, uh, in Africa and in other uh, continents. Thank you. Eh, sí, yo quería comentar sobre, el, en relación a la pregunta que nos ha hecho, que es muy interesante, porque está planteando un... With regards to the question that you're asking, while well, you are talking about museums and about a change that's taking place in museums during the last decades, a museum of artistical representations that were replicas of things that you could see in different countries. Uh, that was uh, extensively done in the 19th century. It became very fashionable. And at a given point in time, with this concept of reconverting uh, art heritage in something more conventional, lost value. Now. Uh, replicas are used in many museums, sculptures made out of uh, clay or out of yeast. It's not uncommon. Now, the question is, um, what's the value of the concept of originality? We're projecting our own concepts on others. In Asia, for example, it is very frequent that the uh, renovation of a temple involves the absolute renewal and change of all the materials, all the wooden elements, all the painting, etc. But for Asians, the new temple is its the same temple because it's not the materials that matter, it's the spiritual value. So I think it is very interesting that you have brought up the question of 
the original piece, uh, which is connected to the concept of art, uh, but also to our values. And I think it is worth discussing. There is a higher hierarchization of heritage, which is almost accidental. In art museums, they seem to have a different consideration, a higher consideration than ethnographic museums, for example, not when they just when they deal about ethnographic elements of third countries. Also, uh, when they deal with the, the own culture, they are considered lesser museums uh, because what they exhibit is considered of, of less value because uh, showing, for example, um, objects that come from rural areas in 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 your country is considered less valuable than showing works of art. So here what we're doing is a projection, really, of these values. And it's probably a very European uh, creation, this concept, because the, the very concept of the museum, the, the the, the concept of a place where you preserve objects, it, this is something to be questioned. Uh, is this a, a pattern, a way of understanding culture that probably would have a very different meaning in other countries? I'm just saying this so that we consider the possibility of questioning the very concept of museum. Now, this opens uh, quite a debate, of course. Any more questions? Well, it's a short question. You've mentioned that museums in other countries may appreciate uh, their culture being present in a museum in Europe. To what extent are they interested in having their objects m m exhibited in, in European countries, do they agree with the way in which these objects are exhibited? Um, since you work with both sides and this is so relevant, how do you do this? How can you come to an understanding about, about what to do with these objects that may belong to communities that on occasions no longer exist? Well, I imagine your question is for Mr. Ouvry, because you have mentioned the reconnection of, of communities with the objects. And I'm, when I say communities, I'm, I'm referring to the migrant diaspora. Their connection with the objects that you have in your collection, then I think that the you could also respond the question in terms of how do you justify, how do you uh, link this to these demands that you receive in your own museum? Mm. That there's not one answer. Uh, I believe there's certainly a category of objects and certainly images uh, on which we are very conservative. Uh, right now, actually, we, we had a small project with, with an artist and he used uh, some of the images in our photo collection. And he shows uh, young girls which are naked. He shows um, uh, African citizens uh, in chains. Uh, frankly, we, we we have struggled with with this this art uh, um, um, uh, art project because he also shows some of the comments which were added during the colonial times, and some of those comments are expressly racist. Today, they are completely unacceptable. Um, and so we consider those, those um, images as insulting, as racist, as a way of continuing the stereotyping, the stereotyped way in which we presented Africa during the colonial time. It is interesting because actually in pre-colonial times, the way in which in our art and our history which often Africa was presented, was less stereotyped. This is really something linked to the colonial era. And there I, I connect with, with Andreas, the other speaker, where he says, you know, decolonizing 
our thinking. So we have to decolonize our thinking. It is true that uh, for some objects, these are spiritual objects, and they were not meant to be exhibited. Very often, they were only shown at night. They were only shown to certain people, those who were, for example, a member of a fraternity. And so it is true that in showing them in our museums, we are not respecting the rules, the rules of the societies where they come from. And this can sometimes be uh, uh, something of, uh, uh, can be the cause for, for discussion. I think our only answer can be to, you know, we, we're willing to, to go into a dialogue. I must say, I receive regularly Cameroonese kings recently. I receive uh, um, Chef Coutibier, traditional chiefs from Congo. Usually, they are proud to see those objects. But this is not necessarily the thinking of all. And I believe that there uh, we need, uh, it's one of the words which I try to use often, we need some humility. Uh, decolonizing, decolonizing means that we have to, you know, put uh, aside some of our European ways of looking at uh, our collections, at, and at, at the culture of the other, uh, and, and that we listen and that we, we have a dialogue. There is no, no one answer to that. And maybe for some, it's, for example, human remains, uh, whatever, there is a few places in our museum where you can see a grave, for example, of a traditional chief. But I can tell you that the human remains which you see are fake. They have been printed, they have been painted. You can't see it, but it's clearly indicated our policy is never to expose any human remains in our museum. So there we have taken also a clear decision. For cultural objects, there is not one single answer. Thank you. Una pregunta más. Um, thank you. This is a question for Andrés. You have said something very interesting around the otherification in, during the decolonization process. You have mentioned the danger of uh, becoming distant from those that we pretend to decolonize, where they become the others. So the question is, who has to be decolonized? Because the restitution is part of this larger idea or process of decolonization, but processes are taking place here in a European society within their museums, which are the ones which are burdened with all this history. So in your discourse, you continue to deny, to a certain extent, the responsibility buying um, um, whatever the, the origin of this space is. So who is the subject of this decolonization? Because museums are reproducing all these discourses on subjects, societies, and moments. They're creating temporary fictions about these societies, and they are perpetuating things through their discourses. And I'm talking about histor history and uh, ethnology museums now. Um, I have also followed the conferences organized by the museum during this process. And my question is, for this Spanish identity, and also outside Catalonia, uh, and I'd like to clarify this, why, why is America so because America is so connected to uh, Spain and the Spanish culture, this the, the, in the relationship with the American citizens who live here, what should be the value of all these pieces, all these works of art contained in Spanish museum? What, what do these things mean for you? And we talk about moral restitution or physical restitution. What should we do about it? Well, that's a lot of questions. Okay, who has to decolonize? I think that clearly the first phase is self-decolonization. Uh, our colleague was also uh, talking about this. We first need to change uh, the way that we think. We have to do this ourselves. And in parallel, we need to be able to listen to what other voices say, the voices 
of the true uh, main characters here, the true owners of this uh, heritage. And there were so many questions. The second question, you, we're talking about the Kimbaya collection, which has been um, requested by Colombia. What, what does it mean for Spain? Well, in the first place, it's a gift uh, as part of a diplomatic uh, event. So it's part of the history of Spain. It also has a strong symbolic value because this was a gift uh, and this was a, a heritage which was selected to be rescued in Spain during the Civil War and to be protected. So there is a reconstruction about um, the, the whole history and, and the, the, the knowledge that people have about the Kimbaya uh, collection. However, if you ask people in Spain, where is the Kimbaya collection, most people will, will tell you that they don't know. The same would happen if you ask people in Colombia. So that's a little bit our fault, too, uh, in, in, in terms of our inability to communicate. Now, this detracts nothing from the construction of a symbolic identity. I don't know whether you were able to follow the conference by Roberto Lleras. This is a fictitious contemporary construction based on a physical object, and it creates uh, pain because it is no longer in the Colombian territory from where it was extracted. So this deposit on which identity is built based on objects that don't belong to the country hurts and creates hurt. Now, this is a project that is born in Colombia, and, and they have made this uh, request, and we need to answer to this request as we would to any other. Our relations are mm, very good. We continue to work with the Colombian Institute of Anthropology, and it doesn't depend on the Museum de America whether there will be a final restitution or not. In my opinion, and your last question about whether we have to talk about a legal or a moral restitution, uh, Based on everything I have researched, and uh, this is my very humble perspective because I know there are lots of experts that have been working in Colombia trying to find legal grounds. In my opinion, there is no legal case. It is a great confusion. This was a gift. I don't know whether you know the history. I will summarize the govern of the Republic of Colombia in 1968 brought this collection to the um, American exhibit that was being held in Madrid with the express intention. Uh, well, this collection was being sold in the international market, and the, the uh, Colombian government, government buys it to give it to, the, to Queen Maria Cristina as a gift. So that is an object that is bought to be presented as a gift. Now, legal issues, mm, well, there has to be, work has to be done here. Now, moral issues, I understand that this is archaeological heritage, but there's also a lot of uh, objects from Kimbaya in the British Museum and in Vienna and in Berlin and in many other museums. So we would need to analyze why, if this was a gift from the Colombian government, then the restitution is not based on any act of plundering because the pieces have been acquired later. And, and I do understand it is more of a moral issue, and this is a different type of restitution. And this is precisely the kind of things that we need to talk about. This is what we're here to debate. Is there an actual legal case documented, supported, uh, from a legal perspective, or are we talking about other perspectives? I don't know whether I've been able to answer your questions. Thank you. Hopefully, I have. Do we have any more questions? Then I simply wanted to add, well, I do have a question. I don't know whether to ask it here or to ask Bart directly. Now, when we talk about restitution, which often are uh, made by uh, states we have been created uh, recently and that are trying to build a national identity. What happens with all these pieces which are part of other cultures, which in these uh, new countries are um, 
marginalized or or are not given any visibility. I will give you a very practical case, the case of the Spanish protectorate. Many of our pieces from Morocco come from the Amazigh culture, which is a minority culture, non-recognized culture in Morocco. So one of the great opportunities that the Amazigh culture has is the fact that we can exhibit from here all of their potential and all the uh, specificities of their culture and, and, and their strong personality. So my question would be, do you have cases which could be parallel to this case I have mentioned with the Amazigh culture? And also, in the case of the Museum of Africa, I can imagine that you will have pieces from, from a diversity of cultures that that can be found in in the in, in the Democratic Republic of Congo. So, do you find yourself in in a situation where these cultures also want to be visible and appreciate the fact that this has been preserved in a museum where it can be seen? Bart, I don't know whether you would like to say anything about this. But I, I believe that the one who really answered to this uh, is Andreas, when he gave, when he mentioned a number of conditions for us to act in a legitimate way. Um, you know, we do not have a monopoly of knowledge. If we, as museums, if we succeed in letting the people of those communities express themselves then we, we may have the legitimacy to do this. But for that, we need an approach which is innovative, which is not the approach of even a few years ago. We have to admit that it's only since 20 years, I believe, at least here in Belgium, if I look around and what we do with Africa. It is, it is not so long ago that we have started changing our, our focus and that we look, first of all, at the human being behind all those objects. We have to admit that we, 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 we tended to be a museum of African art, which forgot about the cultures and about the events and the whole history behind it. So I believe, yes, we can, but we should do it in another way, uh, not in the old ways. So decolonization, in my view, and, and that was the, the, the previous question, it is something which we have to do, both of us. Yes, we need to decolonize, but in my case, my African counterparts also need to decolonize. It means, for example, that they do not limit themselves as being victims of colonization. There are today sovereign nations, there are sovereign peoples, there are sovereign, there are communities which live, well, not always, but which at least tend to, to live or want to live, aspire to live in a democratic and open society. Um, if we can factor that in, I believe we can do that, but only if we do it in the right way. And I think that there, Andreas really put a number of, of excellent conditions for doing that uh, in order to be legitimate and in order to do it in a correct way. Thank you. Bueno, si no hay más preguntas, lo que haremos es... Well, then, if we don't have any more questions, we will now give the floor to Mr. Clementa Meca, who had prepared a monographical conference on a very specific topic, which is what he describes the our genre of found objects, that he describes them, and which continues to dominate the contemporary artistic discourse. 